Special thanks goes to our gold sponsor, Accenture. We have a conference now, huh? All right. How many programming languages do you use on a daily basis that get to have a conference? Huh? And a conference of this size, you know, first conference, and it's already of this size. And I'm just very excited. And uh, I'd like to put an emphasis on the fact that uh, this conference is organized completely by the community, for the community. Uh, there's no, no weird kind of expensive donation from a hidden sponsor or anything. There are lots of donations. Um, and by these folks in particular, these are the organizers of the conference. So if you can just give them a round of applause. Um, organizing a conference is a tremendous amount of work. Uh, everybody says that all the time, but uh, lots of people don't empathize enough with this. So in case you don't, let me offer you an analogy. Maybe this will help. So imagine you have a few friends coming over you know, for a party tonight, right? So now imagine instead of a few friends, there's a few hundred strangers coming somewhere, and then uh, you spend a month calling them, and some of them bail on you, and uh, the party stretches on for three nights, basically, right? And uh, Oh, also, you lose money if some people bail on you, so, yeah, it, it gets really hard. These people really took care of everything, and we're really starting with Bang. Um, this conference room, for those watching the recording, is actually packed, and we're, we're, we have people uh, uh, sitting on the side because we're like, missing chairs now. Uh, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's a little bit early to say this now, but thanks to the, this popular reception, uh, of the conference, we're already thinking of ReasonConf 2019. So uh, just name a place you'd like to travel to and we'll consider it. <laughs> Maybe in America, probably. Better fly for me. <laughs> um, so now, if you think that's exciting, I would like to first um, take this time to give you a technical update of the few of the things we've been working on. So, first thing is reformat, right? Everybody's favorite and some people's least favorite formatter. It's about to get a whole lot better thanks to two particular improvements by community members. So first, it now preserves empty line between, uh, you know, full lines. Isn't that cool? It looks like table of stakes. Some stuff look, looks very easy, but uh, it's very hard to pull it off. And this is by Iwan from the community. He will be ta doing a talk on the specifics of the formatter later on, and it's very interesting. It looks so simple uh, on the surface. Um, so basically, uh, what it does is, uh, if you have multiple lines, we collapse them into one line, but if you already have an empty line between module stuff or top-level declarations or record, uh, they will be preserved correctly, and you will get to have this nice formatting. And it's still based on the EST, not a source file, which is great. Uh, pretty funny, too, how they pull it off. Second one, uh, semicolon recovery by Fred of Merlin fame. <laughs> Lots of people like this, I think. Um, so the parser now gracefully, uh, gracefully recovers from accidental omissions of semicolon. So no longer will you have these weird error messages because you forgot a semicolon somewhere and it says, well, missing end of struct or anything like that. It will recover, and when you reformat the file, it will put the semicolon back on. And instead of failing cryptically, uh, the code will still compile. So you might wonder why we don't just uh, drop the need for a semicolon altogether. It's because, um, well, uh, there are some nuances. In some cases, it's still needed. And the reason is not exactly like JavaScript, and not exactly like Swift, for example. And uh, you know, when, when it comes to attribute and some part of functional application, it's still a little bit hard, but we're discussing about it. It would be nice to have. Reason React. All right. Uh, we're ready for React 16 now. Uh, Reason React is designed from the ground out to be React uh, async compliant, uh, and in theory at least, uh, you should not need to make any code change at all. Uh, the type checker will do its work, and the, uh, the API design will do its work, and it should, be, it should just work. Uh, but you know, famous last words, right? <laughs> um, uh, we're slowing down the, the, the Reason React uh, release cycle a little bit for the next few months uh, to work on a little bit more on the polish of the internal code base. Um, 
uh, in particular, we've removed the dependency on lists and stuff like that. So there's no question that it will be small enough to fit into your code base. Some code base uh, uh, have um, some weird constraint around size. Uh, Reason React will fit into your code base no matter what. Um, there's been a multitude of releases, each of which uh, is accompanied by a, a migration script. But uh, we would like to st still, uh, just because we have migration script doesn't mean we should you know, chug out like five releases per month or anything. Uh, we're waiting for the community and the tutorial and everything to stabilize and catch up before giving an another round of uh, iteration. And the next one is actually, or the next next one is extremely exciting, but I'll keep this as a mystery for now. Um, <laughs> So, so yeah, you don't want newcomers to come in and, and see that there are five different tutorials advocating for five different best practices or whatever. And this is basically why we're uh, aiming for stab stability right now. Uh, oh, by the way, these kind of changes, these kind of announcements are never, ever the source of truth for us. And I would like the community to follow this. You should not propagate these kind of information purely through word of mouth, through conference talks or blog posts. They should be in your repository somewhere formally documented. And this is what we did. There's a changes markdown file and future markdown file. And uh, you know, uh, these will describe our plans, and you can contribute to them right? uh, if you need any precision. Right. Buckle script interrupt, uh, aka half the reason why we're here. <laughs> um, Buckle script intro has been amazing, and we took a pretty, uh, I think, pretty unique approach among the, the other uh, languages. Um, and in particular, I would like to advertise one feature that has already landed uh, in Buckle script three that people don't know about, and which will probably just change the entire game of uh, Buckle script interop. Um, we've been already testing this in the Messenger code base, so we can rest assured that this is already very solid. Uh, this is called bs.deriving abstract. And what, what it does is basically you provide a record type definition, just a normal record type definition, all the, all the keywords like mutable and whatever, they still work, the types still work, and you annotate it with bs.deriving abstract at the top. And what it does is it generates accessors for you under the hood using bs.get and bs.set for each field when it makes sense, and it generates a creation function for you with optional labels and whatever, and it compiles all to JavaScript, uh, JavaScript objects. So this uh, will be the way to interrupt with JavaScript objects uh, for us in the future, at least in, for JavaScript uh, record mode. Um, and as always, it's a fantastic work, and it has no runtime cost. Everything you create is inline. All the accessors, all the setters, all the creation function, there's no trace of it in the output. There's absolutely no cost. And we, we put a pretty big emphasis on the no cost aspect. Um, people, p some people don't understand why, and they're like, oh, why don't you just write more converters and wrap them for better experience and all that? It's the, th the fact is that um, from our experience, when you have no cost, it's much easier socially to justify to your teammates and, uh, to, uh, and uh, skeptical teammates and managers about uh, adopting reason on your code base. Uh, let me explain why. Um, you might have, if you try to explain reason and adopting your code base, you might have uh, encountered some uh, obstacles. For example, uh, there's always this one person that says, oh yeah, but do you know the performance complexity of this thing? Uh, how much complexity are you adding to our JavaScript stack? How much complexity are you adding uh, to our runtimes, uh, whatever stuff? And, and the, the thing is, they're right, right? Some, some newcomers, they don't know the performance complexity of this. They don't know the intricate details. They, 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 you, you might make the, the app like 10 times slower because in the hot path, there's now a huge conversion function or something like that. But uh, newcomers, they also have the right ideas. And even if they can't explain performance, they can trust us that we're doing our work. But how do you convey that to your coworkers? And a very simple social co coding cheating strategy that we've given you is uh, we, we erase the cost completely at runtime. And this way, um, you know, when a teammate asks you, uh, what kind of payload size increase is this, and what kind of runtime performance impact, do you understand the JIT and whatever? And you just say, well, look, this is code that you would have written by hand yourself. It's just that we put a better tool chain and a type checker at the front, but there is no cost. So you, know, you can deduce from first principle what follows. Uh, this is a very um, important motivator for us. Reprocessing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the one person in the room, <laughs> the, the creator of reprocessing, uh, being excited. No, reprocessing uh, uh, doesn't get mentioned enough, 
but it's of a fundamental importance to us. Um, if you haven't realized this, let me give you a hint of why. Okay? It draws to GL, it draws to OpenGL, it draws to WebGL, and it can draw to Metal, and it's cross-platform, so, you know, just let your imagination run, right? Um, Jared, who is in the uh, audience today and who will be doing a talk, he already shipped a game uh, from one single code base to three platform, and he made some money. So, you know, it, it's <laughs> making money is very important for us to, uh, I mean, for uh, <laughs> The consumers may, uh, of reason making money is very important to us. Reason is a working language, and we will, uh, we will like a broader adoption. And, you know, uh, you've got to be realistic about real world needs. Debug mode, all right? Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but, you, um, but to simplify it, you add this statement on top of your file uh, at the entry, and now you get uh, Chrome inspection for variants, records, and they are all recursive, and there's no mode, all right? You, there's not a separate compilation mode, performance differences, or whatever. This guy is waiting to uh, applaud, so you can applaud. <laughs> Again, this looks extremely simple, but it was very hard to pull off. There is no difference between the representation of uh, debug time, whatever, or runtime, whatever, so we don't need a mode. In, in, in the future, we'll likely need a mode, um, but not now because we don't have the uh, complexity budget for it. And it's good that you can just use it and uh, not worry about like uh, underscore, underscore dev and then all the difference and the debugging, uh, debuggability of things. Keep it simple, right? Oh, and the, this works in uh, Node.js, too. So. All right. Tr drum roll. OK. <laughs> um, Belt. Belt is a set of, uh, uh, it's a library comprised of a bunch of data structures and helper that we've been working on and that we're actually using in production. Um, uh, more, more um, the emphasis is on, on these kind of uh, collections, mutable ones, immutable ones, and uh, others. Um, here are a few highlights. First, it's idiomatic JavaScript. It's camel case. Everybody cares about that, so, you know. Uh, naming convention is very JavaScript-y. Uh, not, not too much compromise there. And it's fast. And it's blazing fast. Because usually, you know, uh, when, when people present, like, the, the concept of immutability to their coworkers, one of the questions is, you know, uh, how performance this is. And, and unfortunately, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of excuse uh, um, in, in, the, in all these justification, and they'll tell you, well, if you use it in conjunction with React and should component update, maybe you'll get a performance benefit. But, you know, we, wa we don't want to make any excuses. This library is fast, and actually the mutable version of the data structures are tested and are faster than the ES6 native counterpart in the browser. So that's a huge achievement. Um, blazing fast, you know. <laughs> Could you guess of, uh, at the level of irony I'm operating at? Um, <laughs> we made benchmarks, uh, but I personally don't like uh, these kind of benchmarks for, for various reasons. But feel free to make your own, and we can audit them for you and maybe gather them in one place. To, uh, you know. And uh, all, uh, all I'm going to say is uh, the implementations are written by Bob, uh, who made BSB. So when we say they are fast, we guarantee they are fast. It's not just, oh, it's fast if you use it in, in React 16 in conjunction with this, this, this. No, it's just fast. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes an order of magnitude or two faster. And um, hopefully you think that BSB is one of the fastest build systems you ever used. So, you know. um, also, it's tiny. It's tiny, and again, we're not making any excuses there. It's not, oh, it's tiny if you use dead code el elimination, which I always feel is a little bit weird, because if you're in a real-world big production code base, you're using every functionality. So th there's no benefit to dead code elimination sometimes. For smaller project, yes. So this is tiny when you use dead code elimination and when you don't. Right? It's tiny all around. Um, so um, uh, another uh, very interesting characteristic is that the main data structures, they are sorted by default. So the keys are sorted for you, and if you're a set, the set is sorted by default for you. So if you ever need to keep two data structures and express your intent a little bit weirdly, you know, you keep a, you keep a, hash, uh, you keep a hash map and then you keep an array for the ordering of the keys. No need for that anymore. No more overhead uh, in these. Um, and also the sortedness is very important for us in the future for a few interesting things. Hint, uh, only reason has them. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and it's specialized for string and numbers, too. All right. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry. It also comes with a buckle script by default, so there's nothing else to install. There's no big cost there. Um, and by extension, it comes with reason by default. Now, all these benefits are, are really great and all, right? But this next benefit probably just, you know, uh, just, just, uh, I guess so, yes, blows all of them away. And I, I would say blow all, all the technical update uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, until now away. Um, Belt works as a standalone vanilla JavaScript library, as a substitute to whatever immutable JS library that you're using. And it's, gen uh, it's fast in every possible way. So this is an example, and this is, this is not instrumented in any way. Uh, I went into a random repository I had. I started Node, and I required the, the uh, buckle script repository from there. And here is a node repo, right? No reason, no buckle script involved. And this is how I'm using it. And you can see that the output is extremely clean. The representation is also very clean. This is actually just a traditional, very, very well fine tuned AVL tree, the, the granddaddy of all, all uh, balanced binary trees. And it's extremely fast. Um, of course, the bell is written in OCaml and all, but it generates JS output. And since it, buckle script already generates to ES6 or ES5 or, or AMD or wh whatever, uh, you can use it everywhere, and there's no Webpack configuration nor Babel configuration needed. So it's, it, it hits pretty much all the sweet spots possible. Um, so what does this imply, though? This implies that you, as a developer, again, socially speaking, if you're having trouble convincing your manager or teammates to use Reason or buckle script, which is, which is totally normal, that will be fine. You can start by recommending them this great vanilla JavaScript library, right, <laughs> of immutable and mutable data structures, so show them some performance and size benefit and all of that, uh, and interop benefits. Uh, no other commitment needed. This is huge. This is like reason, but in another way, right? Um, and once you co your code base is already enjoying the benefits of these great data structures, uh, you can nudge them a little bit and tell them that you know, they get to reuse the same data structures and uh, the same API, the same size and performance benefit. Once again, you don't have to analyze that anymore. And in a language, you, you, can, ask them, you, you can now do it in a language where this, is, this comes by default and has lots of other features built as a first-class citizen with proper potential sugar in the future, potential pattern matching in the future, right? It's a nice sell. So it basically, if your, your coworker was skeptical of Reason before and buckle script before, this suddenly turns adopting Reason from, from, a, from their point of view, a high-risk, dubious benefit proposition into one that's low on risk and has, that has already proven benefit. It already works in your code base. So this is extremely exciting. The whole, whole app should be built around data structures anyway, as the common wisdom suggests. So to reiterate on the benefit of a normal library such as Belt, that's compiled normally with buckle script without any special tuning, there's a great stack trace and debugging experience, right? Um, buckle script compiles to all, all, the, all the whatever ES3 if, even if you want, so there's no extra tooling needed, still idiomatic JavaScript. Uh, and uh, one more thing, it works on BSB native. So it works on native too, you get to use them too. And they are still blazing fast. If you wish to know more about the detail of how we actually pull that off, uh, talk to me after this talk. It's very exciting. So it's very crazy to see all these uh, exciting efforts concretized right now. And uh, I, I can't help but to uh, look back and see how uh, a few years ago, Reason was just this thought experiment by Jordan, uh, plus some dirty JavaScript prototypes, you know, when he, back when he was still writing uh, uh, React Native and all, and React. And uh, as the community starts to grow from these experiments into um, something that's used enough by, uh, by enough people worldwide to warrant its own conference and soon uh, its own culture, uh, I would like to dedicate the second part of this talk to express some of the, my higher level wishes for the community. Um, just three of them. Uh, there is a lot of wish I wish I could cram into this talk, but uh, here are the three most important ones that I think we might actually get wrong. So, you know, take it as a preventive measure. My first is about uh, execution and craftsmanship. Um, and I would like to, with a small, uh, to start this with a small story that's unrelated to us. 
Um, there was this story of a private meeting between a journalist and, and Steve Jobs back then, um, back around 2006 and 2007, before the iPhone was released. And uh, upon briefly examining the, uh, examining the iPhone, the journalist said, well, you know what, this is great and all, but the software-based keyboard might be a deal breaker. And, you know, the calling might be a deal breaker, the scrolling might be a deal breaker, the integration might be a deal breaker, blah, blah, blah. So, in, uh, so in theory, a naive software keyboard would indeed have been a deal breaker as it has been before iPhone. And except the iPhone software keyboard was nothing but naive in terms of execution. So for one, it may sound as you type, so it has restored one of the many tactile dimensions, at least, uh, of a hardware keyboard. Um, the letters on the keyboards are hidden by your finger but expand upon tapping, so it's extremely convenient, especially for passwords and stuff like that, and it, and, and it registers subconsciously into your mind. Um, uh, it's contextual, which uh, and it's supported in many format languages thanks to its software nature. Uh, before that, hardware keyboards were a little bit primarily designed with Western audience in mind. And what some people don't realize is that it actually has this, uh, I don't have a screenshot, but it has this concept of hot zones. So in a lazy implementation, the, the hit area of a, of a button of the keyboard uh, corresponds to its on-screen rectangle, like a button, right? But on that keyboard, the hit area actually dynamically, the invisible thing, actually dynamically resize as you type per letter. So when you type the word pizza in English and tap that final letter A, even if you absentmindedly nudge your thumb a little bit and tap close to the letter S, it will still register as an A. So that was, that was pretty impressive, and, and nobody realized it, but they realized after they used another keyboard, they can't explain why, but they're like, you know, this is not as good for some reason, right? I see some people actually taking out their iPhone and trying this, but uh, <laughs> you can try that. <laughs> um, and, and finally, when you still type things wrong, it does a last-ditch attempt at uh, suggesting a, a providing auto-correction. -cor and more importantly, the auto-correction is shown asynchronously, but synchronously applied when you send, send message in, say, iMessage. So when you made a typo in the last word and quickly press send, it still sends with the autocorrection, which is important for small messages. So basically, it's, it, was, um, and it was so good that it was maybe not, uh, still not as good back then as a hardware keyboard, but it was no longer a deal breaker, and there's nothing but execution in that. Here's an unrelated example. I'll explain why I, I choose these uh, examples. Um, there's a great blog post inspired by Sophie Alper of uh, React.js. Um, it's called Breaking Down the Amazon Mega Dropdown. I would like to uh, show uh, a GIF, but uh, I have no idea how to make GIF works in, in, in Keynote, so just imagine this. Uh, this is a, a typical bootstrap menu, and if you, ho uh, if you go from, uh, hover your cursor from more option to, let's say, the last uh, nested second level link thing, Right, if you do this motion, this, the menu actually disappear because you just hovered out of the, the more option uh, area, right? So, so it's a very annoying experience when you have a nested menu and, and, you, and you try to select the thing, and especially when you, when, I don't know, when I look at my, I, my parents doing this kind of thing, it's like, ah, uh, they just, the menu disappear, and they're like, oh, well, we're clicking on nothing now. Let, let me find that menu again. And then you just, uh, uh, <laughs> so, um, how do you correct this, right? So uh, Amazon actually corrects this by using a basic tr uh, trigonometry, and they basically calculate the velocity of your mouse and the destination of your mouse on the current path and do an interpolation or whatever. So if they detect that you're hovering over into a nested menu, they don't actually, they, they still keep the hover, right? So this is extremely, uh, uh, extremely good uh, but invisible um, user side enhancement. And all the macOS native menus are like that, too. If you re-implement one, make sure you get this right. Or, you know. and here's a, another seemingly unrelated thing. Uh, when iOS 7 came out, there was this uh, concept of squircle that people were, uh, and designers and engineers are chasing after. And, and it just you can't explain it, but the icon just look a little bit smoother for some reason, for whatever a vague de definition of smoothness. And uh, until recently, the F Figma team actually found uh, the almost right equation, and, and there's a lot of math behind it. So if you, if you just uh, put a CSS rounded radius thing, um, 
you know, it's, it doesn't feel as smooth for some reason. One last thing, I promise. <laughs> so how is this rated? Um, it's probably not, but uh, SpaceX rocket launch. I don't know if uh, m uh, many of you watched it. It's when Elon Musk just propelled a Tesla into space. It was the best PR ever. Um, so when people are watching the actual launch, they, they see the rocket move, right? And they don't realize that the screen follows the rocket very well, even though the, 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 you know, the camera is so far away. Normally, if you take, take out your iPhone and you try to follow the rocket, what it gives you is that you, you can't capture the rocket. It will just, on your screen, it will just jitter everywhere because you won't be able to follow the exact trajectory of the rocket because it's so fast. And th this details how they actually pull it off. Okay. Enough of these examples. Uh, you, you might find it peculiar uh, that I'm singling out these examples. I actually have an entire collection of these. Uh, the thing is, people think that coming up with an idea is 90% of the work. Right? Reason has, has a type system. Wow, we're done. No, no we're not done, right? Um, every person who has seen a project to its completion knows that the idea is more like 10% of the work, and the rest is all execution. Iteration, dead ends, feedback, fixes, overhead, whatever. And doing something and doing something well are almost two different tasks. Right? Uh, tasks. You know, th there's a famous saying, there's the first 80% and there's the last 80%. Um, now, why is this relevant? Uh, when we started working on Reason all the way until now, uh, I would like to address the elephant in, uh, in the room. One of the most frequent questions we get is, why not TypeScript? Why another type language? You know, what is face we're trying to do here? Um, so first of all, everyone on the Reason team genuinely appreciates TypeScript, for real. Uh, TypeScript explicitly, explicitly makes some compromises in favor of better ed editor integration and uh, assistance, and we made another side of trade-offs. But let's set this aside for now. The, the general problem I see is that in these discussions, because type system is still a, a relatively new concept to the front end, uh, uh, who are more used to dynamic languages, uh, whenever we talk about this, they, uh, people's m mental set, uh, they, they suddenly flip into a mental set where they talk about uh, the laundry list of features instead of talking about the depth of a feature, the quality of a feature. So it's very hard to see a Reason newcomer excited about Reason, understanding why it's good, but explain it to a coworker. Because they're like, uh, the coworker might say, well, TypeScript has nullables too, so what's the big deal? Oh, TypeScript has a build system. You know, what's the big deal? And, and it's very hard to, uh, to, to convey this nuance, right? And, and then that's, that's normal. Uh, quali uh, qual qualitative nuances are, are very hard to convey. And, uh, and you can't just take two lists and compare, uh, of features and compare by, by length. This is not the way I think our community should work. And <clears throat> And, and, but on the bright side, some folks not understanding why Reason ever needs to exist in the first place uh, is actually a secret we weapon of ours, right? The fact is we do exist, we're thriving, we're working in production code bases, so we did something right, and people don't understand why. <laughs> so, and the, you know, the build system, the interrupt guarantees and others, um, it's not, uh, they, they might not even want to copy the, all these things that they don't even see as advantages, but they are real advantages. And even if they copy them, by the nature of execution, it's very hard, right? Uh, you, you need to get the type system right, but, but then at the meta level, you can always screw up. You can screw up the build system. You can screw up the pack package management. You can screw up the community, and it, it becomes like a language nobody wants to work in, right? Only if, when you carry all those quality and execution all the way to the end, do you, have, uh, do you get to have a nice final experience that shows the execution? Otherwise, it doesn't. And to, to be clear, when I'm advocating for high quality of execution, I don't mean that you should try and support all the features or unnecessarily make a code base complicated. Uh, on the contrary, um, when I'm talking about quality, I'm talking about going the extra mile and, and check all those check boxes and more. So first, uh, there's a famous saying, make it work, right? Make it right and, and then make it fast. And, and something that nobody talks about, after you make it fast, you're gonna make it simple. You, you, right? You gotta maintain this thing, right? You, you make it fast, but there's gonna be breaking changes and there's gonna be adoption related stuff. So you gotta make it simple. And I want us to go the extra mile. And yes, it is hard, but it is definitely worth it. It's a different kind of 80% work that you're doing. And it also doesn't, it doesn't mean that we discourage free-from free exploration in user land. Uh, 
you know, it's, it just means that whatever you advertise on your projects, readme, you deliver on it, and, and you're proud that you didn't cut any corners. Right? And, and basically show craftsmanship and professionalism. And finally, it doesn't mean that if you're a newcomer, you're necessarily dis at a disadvantage because you can't ship high quality stuff. It doesn't mean that even this chart doesn't show the whole picture, right? There's the whole meta level thing like documentation, example tests, uh, issues, maintenance, pull requests, and all of that. Showing care does not require expertise, yeah? And on the flip side, the lack of execution will be a silent killer to the community. Some people expect that they can just release, uh, uh, you know, it's a little bit um, stereotypical of open source. Uh, they, they think they can just release a careless prototype and have potential users just file issues against them in the repository to crowdsource the fixes. Except that this only works when the switching cost is high. Right? When the switching cost of the library is low, the user will just go somewhere else. Because why would they bother filing the issues and waiting for you to fix them when there's an alternative that they can use right now that's just executed better and doesn't have the problem your project has. Sometimes you don't get the benefit that people file the first issue to you. You can't just put a, a, a careless repository out there. You need to polish it, right? And then iterate on it. And I would like to remind you that React as an, uh, as an idea has been done before too. And it's successful precisely because the execution matters. Jordan has iterated on React for more than 10 API, API iterations internally before saying this is good enough for open source. And even then, we iterated over the last four to five years. And what sets React apart from the previous failed attempt in other communities um, is the exceptional, exceptional team of engineers handling the community support, uh, the great upgrade path, the stableness, uh, most of which become, quickly become a deal breaker if not handled properly, but none of which are reflected in the mere idea, in the mere 10% of uh, uh, React. The execution is what made React great, and its bad execution will be its demise. And finally, so next time you come up with an idea and are worried that someone copies it, for example, if you're at a startup or at a whatever, um, tell yourself that you're overly focusing on 10% of the idea. You know, the rest of 90% is where the real battle is fought. So when you see a library for the Reason community, I would like you to, you know, it's okay to hype it up, but first make two independent judgments. Is the idea good? And second, is it actually good? You know, is it, is it performant, right? It, does it actually work as intended? Does it work well? Is it performant? Is it simple? Does it eat into my app's complexity budget if I include it as a transitive dependency? Because now it matters. And as a creator of the library, I would like you to ask the question, is it good? Is it something that when open source is something I'm proud to maintain? And every other question is secondary. The second focus I would like to, uh, you to have is, um, is to the focus on the product. Uh, Messenger and Facebook chat were the first in a growing list of product to adopt reason internally. Uh, when the topic comes up, it, it always surprises people when they learn that I have never officially been on the Reason team ever. Um, back when we were forming the team, I very intentionally decided not to join. Uh, my rationale and my hunch was that the best way to iterate on such an infra-level piece of thing was to stress test it on a real-world, messy code base with no hand-holding, no, no, no pursuit of perfect abstraction or whatever. And it made us so much more grounded. Here are a few examples. Right off the bat, some of the fancy abstraction I wrote a few months earlier uh, started to show their heavy costs, uh, and in a funny way. So I tried to execute them well, but uh, they inevitably still uh, leaked a bit. And so, so the more abstraction I put into place in, in hope of easing, easing it for newcomers, the more confused they get, uh, ironically. And, and a confused newcomer is just so much <laughs> less effective at even regular tasks they will usually be good at. So we, we just dial back a little bit on the, uh, this. We also decided to adopt and collaborate with BuckleScript, which was not obvious at the time when you were on a purely infra team. Uh, the BuckleScript externals are erased, so the conversion, uh, converted reason codes compiled JavaScript looks very familiar to the original handwritten JavaScript, as you all know. And I could trivially eye the difference between the before and after uh, a JS file in terms of conversion in a, con a version control. And thanks to that, during the first few months, I've committed personally zero new bug into the code base and, and introduced zero performance regressions. And that, that dumb, simple approach 
a dirty approach was way more effective than whatever architecture we had came up, came up with it before, whatever conversion niceness we had before. Um, and then we made reason react work on a real code base instead of like the react mean that you see in the in the repository and subsequent releases and, and all avoided the pitfalls that uh, and that were will exist if you're just thinking of how you think the user are using your library i was forced to write upgrade scripts you know because we ourselves needed them so i published them too and they have been proven very helpful and all of the, this in turn made us execute our broad ideas much better which tie back to the first point I made, and it made all the difference. And so here, here's a quote that I would like the Reason community to adopt by Steve Jobs, but uh, let's just uh, steal the quote. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. Before joining the Concrete Product team, I was designing the infra without Concrete Product, designing API without Concrete usages, and designing all the things without giving examples. And I was sadly designing purely for how it looks in terms of engineering, with no idea how it actually runs. There needs to be a feedback loop and the tightest possible feedback loop. And all of this, I did it, despite uh, honestly having prior experience in products and in multiple companies and, and prior in experience in infra too. So you really have to think of the product each time. Now some people might object to this uh, uh, bottom-up uh, um, iteration approach and they'd say, what about thinking top-down from first principle? Well, the language is already top-down, so you, you don't have to worry about not ever thinking first top-down. And it's also like, not like I'm asking you to never generalize or anything, but you need to know if what you're generalizing over is even useful, right? It's like debt code elimination from, the, uh, uh, from, a, uh, from a social perspective, right? The other way around. And for two, even successful people who preach thinking from first principle got there by brutally iterating on real products. Think about it. My third wish for you is to find a mentor and or a friend in the community. Uh, it could be a mentor-student relationship or a simple friend relationship. Um, and here's what the bootstrap person has to say on this matter. I was pretty confident I wouldn't learn anything building Bootstrap. Getting together and creating something with your friend is amazing and for me, easily one of the most fun and rewarding things I do. I love it and that's why I've done it and will continue to do it. Sometimes things become boring and it's not, you know, you, you gotta make it interesting. That's a real life fact. Um, some people never get to have a mentor. Uh, some people uh, have a tremendous potential but they never get, really get the chance and any boost that help them reach the activation energy needed for various things. Whereas in our community, uh, I've seen people who barely know JS find mentorship and put decent reason React code into production and having a chain of small enlightenments over the course of a few months. So it's like the old proverb, you know, give a man a fish and he'll be fed for a day, teach a man how to fish, you know, he'll be fed for a lifetime. Also, if the teacher is a, is fishing alongside a man, then it's a real party, right? Everybody gets to have fun and they have fish at the end. So, you know, do that. Find a mentor and have fun. Easy tip when looking for a mentor in programming. Um, look for people who, around you who understand at least one abstraction level lower than the one you usually work with. Um, by definition, they, they understand what's going on under the hood, so they're an invaluable source of insight, you know. Uh, Anyways, I've, always, uh, I've also seen people who individually might be uh, really bored and unmotivated, but when coding together, they become this crazy duo, crazy team. And, and the truth is, modern coding is often a lonely, centralized, atomic activity. Uh, but, but at a meta level, nothing beats someone else pointing out the flaws of your code, and someone else than yourself acknowledging that you're doing a great job. And the truth is, uh, Messenger's adoption of reason wasn't done by a single person either. Uh, I consider myself as having enough credibility to convince my managers to adopt, a, uh, give reason a shot, but no, again, nothing compares to the compounded persuasion, persuasion power of an extra teammate or two or three who are just as excited as you. If you're having trouble adopting reason at a company, um, first try about, and <laughs> having some allies turn, turn the upper management's consideration from here we go, another crazy individual with a hobbyist language, you know, into, well, a quarter of the team is either crazy or they're actually onto something. 
And sometimes when I talk to folks who are excited about Reason but are worried about the prospect of Reason not working out or, or whatever, uh, I, I simply tell them, look, you've made new friends, you learned so many things already, it's already paying off even if Reason stops working tomorrow. Right? So this is what I wish for all of you. Find a mentor and, or a friend in the community, do the proudest and the highest quality work, keep it simple, keep it performing, and ship the best damn product possible. Work from the product backward to the language. Everything else follows. Have fun at the conference. <laughs>